Good morning to everyone connected from the Pacific, Latin America, the East Coast of the United States and Canada. Good afternoon to those connected from Europe. Good evening to those connected from Uganda and India. Welcome to all those who see and hear us from anywhere in the world. It is a, a, a great pleasure to welcome all the speakers at the Third World Congress of Transdisciplinarity. In this Congress week on open science and the decolonization of knowledge. Coordinated by Raja Standom and Badul, co chair of UNESCO Chair in Community Based Research and the Social Responsibility in Higher Education at the University of Victoria, Canada. The, the team of open science and the decolonization of knowledge is a priority for sustainable global civilization and is fundamental in the third Congress on the uh, transdisciplinary. What, 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 are, what, are, but there is some, there are some problems. Therefore, together with the president, what, you don't understand? Uleta. Sí. Diri que tiene que abrir el micrófono. El micrófono. El, el. Ah, usted me escucha. Sí. You have to open the microphone. You have a microphone closed. But on the, uh, on the left. Okay. On the left. Down. Abrir el micrófono. Está. Oh, ok, ok, ok. Now it's ok, but. Do you understand, but? Do you understand, but? but? Uh, Marco Tullio, can you help, but, please? I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm. Now it's clear, but. No. Marco Tullio. Marco Tullio, uh, Julieta. Yes, yes. Uh, now it's okay? I think that Bud can hear us. Yeah. He can't hear. Sí. Marco Tullio. Marco Tullio, no contesta, Julieta. Yes. Marco yes, yes. Tullio. Aparece, por favor. Él, él no puede oír, no sé por qué, Marco Tullio. Hay que ver con él qué pasó. Podemos, Julieta, es better. Let us make us see what we have. But you have the YouTube open? He no está oyendo, no sé por qué. Close the YouTube. I can hear. Let me. Every everybody, okay. st every please stop speaking. Stop. 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 Uh, Julieta, stop. 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 You start again. stop. 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 Julieta, por favor, close. close. Puede cerrar, por favor. Puede cerrar. Puede cerrar, uh, Marco Tulio. Puede cerrar. Yeah. Y tenemos problema. Puede cerrar, Marco Tulio. Cierre la conexión. Everybody. Apaga, apaga, apaga el. Eh, apaga la inicio del Congreso. Uh, sorry. Hay problema de conexión. I, I can't stop the broadcasting. This is a big problem. But you have the YouTube open. Close this window. Have a problem with the audio. This is by the YouTube, it's open. But it's okay now, but no, but it's not okay. Uh, Marco Tulio. Bad doesn't, uh, bad no entiende, no escucha. Wait a minute, I write, I, write the chat. Hello, hello. Hello. I, please. We, we can hear you. Yes, but I am hearing for some reason. No, stop, please, Paolo, please wait. Let Listen, please listen to me. Everybody listen. 
I can hear. <laughs> no, I can. <laughs> no. What happened? Por favor, por favor. Let let me speak. Let me speak. Speak, speak. speak. Yes, but I am I am hearing you two or three times. Two or three times. I I hear Paulo. I hear Marco. Everybody two or three times. So Marco, it's Marco, chaos. In my que earphone, abierta, total chaos. Tiene abierta varias pantalla porque él ve so muchas, YouTube. muchas veces. Okay. Puede okay. ayudarlo. Puede ayudar Marco, por favor. Okay. Eh, I, I write in the chat. Uh, but you you cannot you cannot stop the broadcast. Okay, here we go. But Marco can help you because yeah. you have okay, many... it's okay. It's okay now. It's okay. It's now okay it's okay. Now. Go yeah. to start. Sorry for the confusion. Um, now it's okay. Come together. Uh, ¿Qué hago? Empiezo de nuevo, Julieta. ¿Qué hago? Empezamos de nuevo. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm sorry to participant for these difficulties. We we start restart again to open session of this uh, week. What happened? Marco Tulio? Yes. May I start? Puedo yes. empezar? Yes, 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 please. Bueno, participant, disculpe. Uh, there are some problems, but now all are ready. Uh, todos estamos listos para escuchar. Uh, disculpo si yo empiezo de nuevo. I'm sorry, I, I start again. Good morning to every, everyone connected from the Pacific, Latin America, the East Coast of the United States and Canada. Good afternoon to those connected from Europe. Good evening to those connected from Uganda and India. Welcome to all those who see and they are us from anywhere in the world. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome all the speakers at the Third World Congress of Transdisciplinary in this Congress week on open science and the decolonization of knowledge. Coordinated by Rajesh Tandom at Badul, co-chair of UNESCO chair in community-based research and the social responsibility in higher education at the University of Victoria, Canada. The team of open science and the decolonization of knowledge is a priority for sustainable global civilization and is fundamental in the debate of this Congress. Therefore, together with the president of the Congress, Professor Julieta Ayer, I sincerely thank my friends and colleague Badul and Rajat Tandom for having accepted and organized this important Congress week. And I declare, I declare the week on open science and the decolonization started. And uh, I pass the word to coordinator Badul, with whom I have shared in past years battles for the international affirmation of adult education and uh, participatory research. Uh, let me introduce Badol. Badol is a professor emeritus with the School of Public Administration and the co-chair of the UNESCO Chair in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education. The UNESCO Chair is a, a joint partnership between the University of Victoria and the, the Society for Participatory Research in Asia, located in New, Area, in New Delhi, India. The objective of the UNESCO Chair is to build research capacity in the global south 
and uh, excluded the North in the field of community-based research. It uh, does things through collaboration with many global networks, through advocacy, work with governments and funding bodies, and through training. When, uh, during the discussion, I can introduce other elements of Congress. Uh, please, uh, Bud, you can start. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Paolo. It's a great pleasure to uh, be able to be with you and uh, Julieta and Marco and the other organizers of the Third uh, World Congress on Transdisciplinarity. I would like to begin by acknowledging that uh, as, as, I, as you see me here, I am uh, I am I'm living and working on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. Those are the original peoples in this part of the land uh, who are still uh, with us and still providing care and uh, guidance for, 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 for the use of the land and for improving better relations. This, the peoples, the First Nations communities included in this part of, of the island where I live are the, the, the Esquimalt, uh, the Songhees, and the Kusanish uh, peoples. And it's uh, each day that I uh, get up, I am uh, grateful to be able to, to be sharing uh, this land. I'm, it's my, my, my great honor and my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, um, my friend, uh, Dr. Lorna Wanotsa Williams. Um, Lorna, Dr. Williams is a uh, Lilwatu First Nations, she is a professor emerita from the University of Victoria in indigenous language and learning. <clears throat> she has spent more than 50 years on the recovery and revitalization of first and culture, both in British Columbia, uh, where she was born across Canada and throughout the world. Her work has been honored through her being named as an officer in the Order of Canada, and most recently as a fellow of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. We are extremely uh, grateful to have Wanotsa with us today, and I uh, warmly invite Wanotsa to share her opening remarks. <laughs> Cooks the Muska laps like a lapel down a camuchment to Atla. Look all little what Ula Schwatch and Snook Nook a one ossa and squatcheacher. Bill down at it to Mirsha Ilaquanana, Hoxanacher, Schwatan. Dotla Amash like a little down a camuchment to Atla. De Hoxanach, Mutter Ilaquanan. Mutter Takam. I introduce myself by first acknowledging uh, all of you who've gathered here today and to thank my friend Bud for introducing me. I am very pleased to be here. I speak to you from the lands of the Huxanich and the Lakwanan speaking people. My people are the Lilwatul. All my relatives and my and my relationships are there. I greet them, I remember them, I acknowledge them. I'm very happy to be invited to spend some time with you today to to, to speak about um, to speak about the location of indigenous knowledge, the indigenous wisdom in what we study or what we learn or what we share. I have been working as Bud says for many years in the area of education. And, <clears throat> and one of the biggest challenges that we face, that our children face in schools 
that learners face in, in universities has been the silencing and the exclusion of indigenous knowledge. And this has been about power. It has been about settlers and colonizers having the rights or creating the rights to access land, to access resources that are on those lands. So at the very beginning in every part of this, this planet that has been colonized, one of the first acts was to deny the humanity of the original peoples. And also in the second act, in order to be able to do, to, in order to be able to deny the existence of the original peoples was to deny that they had a language. Language carries and shares our wisdom. It gives us the strength of our identities. And so to eradicate a language was a way of being able to deny the existence of people. And so this is what we need to be able to address if, we, if we're talking about decolonizing knowledge. And one of the areas that, that, um, that is the, one of the greatest challenges is the area of science. Because science was a construction of the Western world. It is a reflection of that world. And does not, is not open to any other world. It's, um, and so it's really important to this topic that you're discussing, that this topic that, uh, that, you're present, that you're having many people across the planet engage in. It's, um, for example, one of the greatest challenges that we face is that in indigenous knowledge, we, we hold that everything is connected. Every aspect of our world is, is, um, is a part of that knowledge system. We cannot, we cannot deny that, that connection, the connection of the physical world, the mental world, the emotional world, and the spiritual world. Everything we believe as indigenous people has spirit. And one of the things that um, that that we that we must that we learn when we enter school is that the only thing that's that is of value is what happens in the mental state. In Sanchathan, the one of the the languages here on the island that I've adopted that I've adopted as home, there's a they have a word, elternicht. And Elton, when I ask people about learning and about teaching and about what we know, that that's the first, the word that they they provide. It means and it means to be a whole human being. So everything we learn, everything we engage in respects and honors the wholeness of being. So all knowledge is inseparable from land, from place, from spirit. 
from language, from relationships, from balance, harmony, and respect. That, um, that in indigenous knowledge, ancestral knowingness is respected and taken into account. And amongst the Dine, the, the word that they use is ke. It means understanding, interdependent, compassionate relationships as they manifest in life that we need to be able to respect and honor the relationship between the earth and the sky, between the self, the family, the community, and the nation, the relationships between the animals and the plants, the relationship between the ancestors and the descendants. It's um, so it's been an assault on um, on those aspects of knowledge, learning, and being in the world. We face many challenges then in the twenty first century. One of the biggest challenges that we must face is to learn, is to have the courage to learn. From the, in, from the experiences of indigenous people. Why is it important to learn from, what to, from our experiences? It's because there are new forms that we practice today of co colonialism and colonization. Through the use of technology, the creation of of the, the tech, tech tools, they now colonize our thinking. I had a meeting last week with one of the, with one of the biggest tel, uh, te, uh, technology companies in the world. And they're promoting, they're wanting to work with indigenous languages and indigenous knowledge systems but they have so much to learn because their whole structure is built on a Western model. And so they impose, they impose that world, that, that way of viewing the world on indigenous people, just in the act of using that system. For example, there are many languages, indigenous languages that cannot use that, their system because it cannot recognize their writing systems because the keyboards that were created, the programs that were created to govern the way that people write are based on a colonizing language. And so we have many challenges that we must face today that we can address by knowing and learning and understanding what colonization has done to indigenous peoples and to our knowledge systems. So shall our knowledge then continue to be excluded and shall it continue to be degraded and disrespected because the form that other people can know it from is from somebody else's point of view and way of describing relationships and the world. It's really important because in every one of our institutions, 
we must address these challenges these these and make these shifts of understanding all the way through school we've been imposed what was imposed on us was to be it was to meet a standard for example and that standard was determined on one society's way of being in the world. It created status making, standard setting, norming. So what we have has become normal has come from basically one cultural world, the Western world. And everybody in order to be able to be to, in order to be able to be okay, has had to meet that standard. That's not this, that's not that. So to, in order to, for us now to address colonization, it's important. It's important that we make the shift, that we figure out how to make the shift from living, being in a world that has created a normalization standard that's in one form, to one in which we can cope with and address diversity and to respect diversity. It will be challenging for us but this is something that in this, this time that you have together, I would hope that there will be much discussion about, about how to live in a world of diversity. When we look at the land, when we look at the lands on which we, on, that we have destroyed, that we live on, in order to thrive, in order to thrive, they need diversity. They need a diversity of, of soil. They need diversity of relationships. They need diversity of, um, of, of how they use the environment. And they do this, they can be different, they can be diverse, but they can work together. They can be together. They support each other in this way. And so there's so much that we can learn from looking and from knowing what happens in the natural world about how to live with diversity. Here in Canada, and I know that this contain, will, is similar in every part of this planet where there has been colonization. There has been an effort to figuring out how to reconcile between the settlers and the indigenous people. And this has been heightened recently by the stories of the locating the unmarked graves at the residential schools that existed on the, in this country. This has been something that has been denied for hundreds of years, that this has taken place, that this country could do that to children and to a whole nation of people. And so we're in the process of figuring out how to see this history, how to know this history, how to acknowledge this history, and to create a different relationship, a relationship based on respect. And so the challenge then is to figure out too how indigenous peoples of every country 
will be known in that country. So it means finally, here in this country, you know, after on this, on this um, part of the world, after almost 600 years, a new relationship needs to be formed. One that's based on respect, one that's based on, on a sense of mutuality. I was speaking last week about the history of my village and about the story about that village and then the coming of the settlers and how those stories are told in our songs, in our stories, our dances. And then I was talking about the creation of a museum that told of the story of the settlers. Nothing in that's those stories told the stories about the indigenous people supporting the settlers coming to that land. They don't want to remember that part of their history, that they needed help and that they got the help and they benefited from the help. So the denial of that kind, that part of history needs to be reconciled in every part of this planet. And we need to find and to find the ways to be able to tell those stories. We need to also acknowledge and respect that indigenous peoples of every part of this planet were there when the settlers came. And they have rights, they have, a, they have the right of self-determination that has been denied them for from the beginning of that relationship. They've had that right, they hold that right, they continue to hold that right. And because of what we've done collectively as humans and much of it through science to destroy the environment, we're living with that. And we have to live with it and deal with it. And one of the and one of the areas in which we can the in which we can learn to deal with it is from the knowledge systems of the indigenous peoples. It's from the stories that people tell. The National Research Agency in Canada, for a very brief time, exercised this, this way of, ser of searching for knowledge. The scientists who traveled, for example, to the, north, the northern parts of this country, found that if they first listened to the stories of the, of the people of the land, that it helped them with their knowledge, their own knowledge system. And so by it's this fear that we have that by accepting indigenous knowledge that we are going to, that we will desecrate the area of science, the knowledge of science is something that we have to overcome. And this group of scientists learned and practiced that they could use both forms of knowledge to help each other. 
that's going to be a big challenge for us. And that means that we need to be able to address in setting aside the colonial constructed relationships. And we need to be able to do that so that the knowledge systems of peoples around the world are seen as of mutual benefit, that we can learn so much from each other by being open to one another and not viewing each other as other. Being able to respect and being able to to be open to other knowledge systems takes courage. It takes an expansion of the mind, which we have, which we can do because we're humans and we have a beautiful, beautiful mind. Let's not keep it closed. We need then to be able to develop an international set of standards that promotes respectful engagement of indigenous people. What should, what we need to be able to co-construct, what are those, what are those standards will be, the standards of, of engagement with people across, the, across this planet that respects diverse knowledge systems and respects the views of all people. This is our challenge in the 21st century. We've spent many, many now hundreds of years elevating only certain forms of knowledge as being the soul, as being the sole areas that we can call knowledge. And now it is our way to be able to finally see ourselves as different, but respect to that difference, also see our commonality and that by and that we all by all working together we can be all one thank you very much thanks bud thank you uh, very much uh, lorna wanotsa williams in the, as lorna said in this part of the of, of the world uh, and in the Sinchofen language, uh, we say thank you by saying Haichka and we raise our hands when we want to show respect and thanks. We raise our hands to you, Lorna. So Lorna, we are delighted Lorna can be with us for, uh, you know, for about 10 minutes if, if you have uh, questions or comments. And there's some questions I see already in the chat so um, I, I will read the, the, the questions. We have a question from Oscar Ochoa uh, from Mexico. Uh, he says, uh, Lorna, how can indigenous knowledge uh, face the capitalistic destruction of Mother Earth? It's a big question, Lorna. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge question and that's probably the biggest challenge that we have one of the, the, you know, the, it is the biggest challenge that we have, as I said, and it's something that we need to be able to collectively work together. It's what I see, <clears throat> for example, when I see the, the destruction of the forests, of the water systems,
we have, we need to be able to go back and look at the, at the knowledge systems of the indigenous people. And one of the things that we need to be able to do as an indigenous person is to break free each of us indigenous people to break free from this from this thinking that we that our our knowledge system is not is not worth it that has been so ingrained in us and it's such a challenge for that knowledge system to come to the front and to be shared. So it's, it's a, so it's a challenge to be shared by us, but it's also a challenge to be heard and to be understood. And so that's probably one of our biggest challenges. I went, I visited my homeland two weeks ago. And because of the tremendous, tremendous heat that we've never had before, all the way up to the mountain sides, up the mountains. Because I haven't been there, I'm sure I noticed it even more. But the glaciers that were there all my life are, are almost gone. So our dependence on fresh water to keep us alive is under threat. We are going to need to find new ways of living. We have always lived with an abundance of water because that's what our natural world has provided. So one of the things that our people are going to have to relearn and relive is sustainability. How do you sustain yourself? And it means being very careful and being very respectful to make sure that everyone has what they need. It means looking out for each other. It means looking out for the land and caring for that land. It might sound simple, but it's very, very challenging to do. It takes a lifetime of learning to care for each other, to care always for the land, to care for the water, to care for the, the air. It means learning gratitude that we have these, that we have this support from mother nature in every aspect of our living. Our knowledge is not just the things of the, of the world. It's, it's how we treat each other. It's what we think of each other. And there are many, so there are many parts of, to that question. I'll take another one, bud. A question from Vinod in India. And uh, Vinod says, how can humanity promote inclusion without we versus them and encourage indigenous traditional knowledge and wisdom to inform modern technological toolkits through crowdsourcing from indigenous communities? Can this be a two-way flow of ideas on equal terms of learning from each other and enriching the knowledge systems? So I began this by saying that everything is connected. That's you know, our basic belief. 
and everything, <clears throat> we're in relationship with everything. One of the things that um, we've done, that we've learned to do um, is to separate, to divide and to, um, um, and to deny that connectivity. And so it's really important. And, and one of the areas that, um, one of the areas that that we'll have the great that we have the greatest difficulty with, for example, is um, the relationship with the spirit world. It's the world, the world um, beyond the physical plane. And so, one of the greatest challenges that we'll have in this, in in being able to um, to learn from indigenous people is to recognize this and to acknowledge that this is an important part of our knowledge system. And that, um, and that, and because of that, there are certain, um, there are certain protocols and um, that need to be, that need to be addressed in sharing that kind of knowledge. And, um, and that will be one of the challenges that we face. And um, so there, there's, um, there are concepts, for example, in our, that you can find in our languages that don't exist in other languages. And we're going to have to figure out how to be able to communicate those how to share them, and how to um, and how to hear them, and how to understand them, and so um, it won't. It's not going to be an easy process. And as I said at the very beginning, the 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 sets of standards and uh, that we've created in the world of technology comes from one as one world, and um, and it's so it's for, so for that that um, for, so for technology to be open and to figure out how to to live in a diverse world is one of the challenges that um, that we that we have in this century in order to be able to communicate with one another we're going to have to figure that out thank you uh, Lorna the last question is coming from from uh, Francisco Paulo Lemos uh, de la Zuana in Brazil. Uh, Dr. Lorna, how can we leverage the change in mentality and attitudes towards Gaia so that the planet survives and a new humanity can emerge? Can transdisciplinarity uh, help with this? Yes, it's the, it's, it's the, probably one of the key steps that um, transdisciplinarity is something that, um, that I think that the indigenous ways of knowing can really help and support. And um, what I worked in the last part of my career in, um, in the higher education. And, um, and I could see how the one of the biggest challenges that we faced is the is the siloing of the disciplines and um, and when we when we began when we begin to break down those boundaries then we can um, then indigenous people can thrive in those environments and when you look at the what indigenous people create that supports what they need in their communities. It is always transdisciplinary. It's, um, it's uh, and so we can learn. And so we can be open to, and, um, to what indigenous, to how indigenous people organize things. Um, we can learn, we, we have, it's an opportunity for us to learn. And, um, 
because we cannot, uh, we have to find the ways. We have to continue to respect that there, you know, that there are um, forms of knowledge, but what we have to figure out how to be able to share those, to cross those boundaries, and uh, and and to not be not to be held so bound by them, and um, it's the only way that uh, um, that we're going to be able to figure out the things that that the planet needs, that our mother the earth needs, you know, to deal with what, um, what we've done and, um, and, and mother earth will do it. It's how we thrive while she fixes herself. That will be the challenge. Yeah. It's our thank, challenge. Thank you uh, so much, Lorna. There, there are many other uh, comments from uh, other people who, uh, thank you very much for the inspirational talk, who acknowledge that the issues you are raising are similar to the issues that they are facing in, in Mexico and Colombia and Brazil and other countries, other parts of, of India. So um, at this time, um, um, we would like to, to thank you once more for your, uh, you know, your very inspirational and extremely fitting uh, set of remarks to which it opens this week's conference on open science and the decolonization of knowledge. And we will take, I, th I think the challenge which you have set forth, which is the, the creation of an international set of standards for engagement with indigenous knowledge and indigenous peoples across the planet um, is, a, is, is a challenge which I think um, fits very well with the, with the objectives and the, the aspirations of the, of the, the, the world of the, the transdisciplinary, the people, Paolo and Juli, and architects of this transdisciplinary uh, uh, world that they, are, that they are helping us uh, with. So thank you very much. We thank wish you. you the best and uh, we'll now uh, continue on uh, with uh, with uh, uh, following your uh, following your spirit as best we can, and uh, and uh, all the best to you and uh, and your family. Hi, Chica. Cook some kale. Oh, mash. Okay. So um, it's my great pleasure. We're going to now continue on with with the, the um, uh, um, uh, Catherine O'Dara uh, Hoppers is. Uh, uh, is, uh, is the next speaker. And it's my very great pleasure. Uh, Catherine is, uh, is a Chole woman uh, from, uh, from the Gulu part of, of, uh, of Uganda. It's a part of Uganda, which I know and love. Um, and uh, and uh, Catherine is an extraordinary uh, scholar, a policy specialist in international development, North-South, disarmament peace. She's a UNESCO expert in basic education, lifelong learning, uh, disarmament, all kinds of you know, world intellectual um, property, uh, property rights. Um, she has a master's degree uh, and a PhD from Stockholm University. She has several honorary degrees from universities in Sweden and South Africa. She's been, uh, she spent 20 years of her life uh, in South Africa. Uh, which is where I began to read. She's been an absolute uh, uh, in the in the lead, uh, you know, in, as an African intellectual in the area of respect for African indigenous knowledge. And she currently holds a professorship in education at Gulu University. And so it's uh, with very great pleasure that I welcome my my very good friend and uh, uh, Catherine Odora. Hoppers, over to you, my dear. Thank you, thank you. Well, yes. Thank you so much for inviting me. My topic is uh, transdisciplinarity, the indigenous knowledge systems and restorative actions. Implications for open science. First of all, 
transdisciplinarity relates to socially relevant issues. It, it calls on us to transcend and integrate disciplinary paradigms and to do participatory research and to search for an, a unity of knowledge. Participatory research including uh, 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 so to include non-academic actors, originally private sector in Europe and the West, but now as I ex uh, now it has expanded to include other knowledge systems and deep epistemological considerations formulated from the perspective of transdisciplinary researchers, the concept endeavors to frame, analyze, and process a socially relevant issue in such a way that the research projects gr uh, grasp the complexities of the issue, takes the diverse perspectives on the issue into account, links abstract and case-specific knowledge and helps to uh, uh, help develop knowledge and practices that promotes what is perceived to be the common good. Of course, we know that interdisciplinary uh, uh, interdisciplinary endeavors means that the researchers from different disciplines come and use their respective methods and techniques and skills to address a common issue. Of course, of course, of course. But transdisciplinary uh, uh, researchers encourage representatives of different disciplines to transcend their separate conceptual and theoretical and methodological orientations in order to develop a shared approach to the research building on a common high level conceptual framework. Now, I turn to uh, the discussion's point in reframing science. First of all, the history of science itself. You know, one of the greatest needs of our time is the growth and widespread dissemination of a true history or a true historical perspective in science. Misconceptions about the origins of science as Eurocentric needs to be debunked and ruptured because the process of decolonization of science and science education can place science in a multicultural space that respects various cultural perspectives on science, uh, on scientific knowledge, not only coming from one uh, uh, ethno um, uh, monochrome. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the objectivity of science. The discourse on transforming scientific knowledge is a problem, uh, problematic and contested field, which raises many, many, many issues and cognitive questions. The argument, especially in, positive, in, in, in positivistic arguments, which argue that the objectivity of science ignores the fact that science is deeply embedded in the politics of knowledge and power. Whose science or whose knowledge is uh, is uh, regarded as authentic and worth validation. 
who determine what uh, I mean, who determines what is conceptualized as universal science. Hmm? Now, uh, let me talk about the role of indigenous knowledge systems. The debate regarding the relationship between science and development and the role of indigenous knowledge systems is a, yet another issue that we need to take into account. Arguments for or against the use of indigenous knowledge in science or regarding science uh, 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 education, I mean, regarding uh, indigenous sciences are informed by what is perceived as appropriateness or inappropriateness of indigenous perspectives and epistemologies. Harding argues that knowledge claims are always socially situation, uh, situation rather than universalistic. By situation, uh, by situating indigenous knowledge systems in their natural environments, not taking them out of their natural environment into a lab, uh, by situating in them in their natural environment and applying indigenous sciences and understandings is a basis for inquiry and investigation. It is argued that science education can open up the possibility of the dramatically extending and recognizing its actual knowledge base. It is further argued that the current scientific practices in education fail to situate knowledge creation in indigenous spaces, fails to link science education to every, uh, everyday life experiences, and fails to stimulate the scientific Im imagination of African students or indigenous students. Mm? In addition, some argue that the, the space or place determines individual experiences of knowledge, uh, of, knowledge uh, on, of knowing. Thus, uh, Green, uh, Greenwood describes places as pedagogy because they shape our experience of, of learning and becoming. What is known about modern science is that it is not created within indigenous spaces. In our case, it is not created within African spaces. Otherwise, we could recognize the fundamentals of it. Mm? Therefore, it is not contextual. Thus, in order to rescue the idea of indigenous knowledge from, uh, 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 from what uh, uh, Gatsani refers to as the snare of colonial matrices of power, there's a need to articulate how the dominant world system came into being, how it operates, what problems it has created and what distortions it has brought to the idea of indigenous knowledge. Fourthly, the, the utilitarian values of science. Learning science requires that uh, some students to cross boundaries between the cultural uh, context of their home family and community, and the cultural context of another, of positive science. But science, uh, but science has to be meaningful and relevant to be of any significant value to the society in which it is, uh, uh, it is uh, generated. The purpose of this type of inclusive science is to represent new possibilities for empowering the marginalized. If science is for development, 
Eh? It is argued that it should reflect the activities generated within the communities. It is argued that members of the local communities should be able to benefit from a scientific system that takes into account the relevant, uh, can you put it up please? Mm. Mm. Uh, um. Uh, the relevant uh, uh, lo lo uh, uh, local knowledge and uh, provides a space for designing or implementing the development projects that emerge. Up, up, please. Up. Mm. The time is now to cross the boundaries between indigenous knowledge systems and other systems of knowing. There can never be a, a space like this because um, uh, uh, as, as uh, Samuel Jackson said, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, justice will only be achieved when those not affected by the injustice are just as indignant of the status quo. Now, restorative action and open science, it is a restorative approach to social and community relations has become a major uh, social movement in the world today. This has called for a change in the way we understand and learn new situation, as well as the way we reflect on all ways in which we used to, to think and act, and which we want to overcome and, and learn. This calls for a new epistemology that is able to reflect the reconstructed ontologies of these different environments. The new approaches call for a new way in which we look at the world no longer as a, a, a hostile natural environment, but as a challengingly friendly environment, which calls for respect for diversity, both human and natural. We would propose that such an approach on the basis of a reformulated epistemology in tackling contemporary problems that face humanity, especially in Africa, and as well as in the, in, in the indigenous communities worldwide, including uh, includes the regime of governance, ethnic and religious wars, environmental crisis, and so on. Pro proceeding from the position that uh, the consideration of IKS as a science still evokes a strong mixed epistemological feelings in the academy. My fellow Lutu emphasized that, uh, emphasized the need to understand the context that has have shaped its conceptual history from generation to degeneration, now to regeneration. While IKS is, uh, is a science, it is also part of a social movement pursuing issues, uh, 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 pursuing issues and values of indigeneity is, uh, such as autonomy, self-determination, decolonization, and restorative healing and justice. There, uh, furthermore, IKS is constituted, uh, 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 constitutes an, uh, an, astre, uh, an ancestry of uh, accumulated wisdom and experiences a mother of cultural, spiritual uh, institution and other complex 
social arrangements and life force uh, uh, that uh, is uh, um, uh, 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 promises uh, um, better future. Now, uh, in conclusion, I, I, uh, I want to share with you um, insights um, from indigenous knowledge policy in South Africa, because uh, I advised the parliament for several years uh, on indigenous knowledge systems, the parliament of South Africa, and uh, I was appointed to head a team drafting the first national policy on the recognition of indigenous knowledge systems, affirmation of indigenous knowledge systems, the development of indigenous knowledge system, the protection of it. So um, uh, this insight, maybe it, it, the, the time will not allow me to go through it all, but I will pick some and uh, uh, but you can uh, raise your hands uh, in case um, I'm stealing your time, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, South African IKS policy includes a commitment to the recognition, the promotion, development and protection and affirmation of IKS. This means that we have to rethink thinking itself. And uh, uh, 10 years ago, I wrote a book called Rethinking Thinking, Modernity's Other and the Transformation of the University. It is uh, uh, just uh, uh, 90 pages, but uh, if you go into it, it would change the way you think. So uh, um, I, uh, I argue that post independence indigenization Focus, uh, focus only on the inclusion of black people in the game. But the, this new indigenization I'm talking about is a different one because we question the rules of the game. We engage in the paradigmatic framework and the constitutive rules of systems you cannot joke with us now. Mm? Cognitive justice defines the right of, of different forms of knowledge to coexist and dialogue with, with each other. Yeah? It helps the weak to engage with the strong in a dialogue uh, democracy. Epistemology or study of knowledge links life world, livelihoods, lifestyles, and life, life cycles into a time circle for democratic imagination. Epistemology is deeply experimental and democracy like science is a deeply experimental exercise. Let us recover the basis of science, democracy, and epistemology. Do I have time? Uh, but okay, oh, yeah, thank you. The typical citizen is not someone who only thinks of uh, productivity, but one who enjoys the diversity, who can vi visualize a world based on something as simple as hospitality. The typical citizen we are talking about, the new citizen we, we want to, uh, to, to, to engender. He thinks of no only productivity in, 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 in into the Western way of thinking, but something as simple as hospitality. Mm -hmm. There is a different way of, of conceptualizing the economics of the gift. So the, the critique of, of economics becomes central to the idea of cognitive justice. 
it is time to recognize the multi uh, the multi uh, the multi uh, I mean the multiplicity of society. We have oral, written, and now digital uh, 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 tradition, and people uh, and the people from each tends to think that uh, their tradition or language marks the begin, uh, beginning of history. But true democracy ensures that the defeated still have a voice. So cognitive justice cannot be a, a rhetorical science. It, in, it involves a reworking the constitution and inviting your opponent to be part of the experiment, part of the eman uh, emancipatory experiment. Hmm. The state and its institutions in Africa have been raised on an epistemological bedrock that is not its own. We may say that we own them, yes, 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 but we do not own the foundation of that bedrock. That is where our problems lies. Eh? So, um, now, restorative action is a way of transforming the culture of oppression, exclusion, and marginalization into one of empowerment and inclusivity. This is based on the recognition that, that understanding, appreciation, and trust and cooperation should be cultivated by knowledge production and a way of thinking and practice. The higher education sector should question the politics of knowledge production and knowledge producers must recognize the plurality of knowledges and allow different forms of knowledge to coexist, okay? Uh, uh, I think finally, equitable learning uh, coming to the classroom has been defined as a process of bridging the learning gap between those who are advantaged and, do, uh, and those who are disadvantaged. And this includes the equality of access, balance of content, and quality of the learning experience. The question which then, then arises is how can indigenous forms of knowledge be used in an equitable learning environment? This includes the recognition and incorporation of IKS into the curriculum as well as teaching and uh, learning pedagogies and embarking on a process of restitution. In, 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 inevitably, this makes transdisciplinary a core facet of research, teaching and learning. A commitment of, uh, to cognitive justice and restorative action uh, uh, requires co-production of knowledge that escapes the, the, the determinating view of science, which is divorce from social context and social determinism. Scientific knowledge must be, must be produced by a process that involves both the scientific method and social context. I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. Uh, a really uh, powerful, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, contribution to our debate. And I, I think uh, in particular, uh, you, your work um, has, you know, uh, is actually uh, giving us uh, concrete ideas about uh, the decolonization process because you've done so much important work in, at the University of South Africa. And I think that the, I think that the, uh, the, the recognition uh, 
system that you helped the government of South Africa with on the recognition, how to recognize and preserve indigenous knowledge may well be something that we could draw on when we attempt to do what Lorna has called on, uh, setting up an international set of standards uh, for uh, engaging with indigenous knowledge and indigenous people. So uh, I really am uh, very grateful. Uh, all of us are extremely grateful for, for your taking time and sharing, uh, you know, such, such a, such a uh, you know, really engaging uh, discussion. I'd like to remind people, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. What we're asking you to do is write down your questions um, and we will have time uh, at the end after everyone has spoken because we want to see, we want uh, the flow of knowledge to be uh, happening across to, you know, all of the speakers. I'm sure you'll find, you'll find uh, commonalities amongst the speakers. Um, it's my very great pleasure now to turn to, to my, my very good friend, uh, Andrea Vargio. Uh, Andrea, um, who um, Rajesh and I have been working with for, I don't know, some 10, 15 years, uh, is, uh, uh, also comes from an island. Um, I come from Vancouver Island, and he comes from Sardinia, which, as you know, is an island that belongs to uh, the, the nationality of uh, these days, the nationality of Italy. Um, it didn't always belong to Italy, but it belongs to Italy now. And they have their own, uh, you know, indigenous people and indigenous stories. Uh, Andrea is an associate professor of sociology in the Department of Humanities and Social Science. He's president of the, he's the leader of the master's degree course in social work and social policy. He coordinates a very interesting organization structure called the FOIST Laboratory for Social Policies and Training. He's recently appointed as a rector's delegate for the third mission. The third mission in the, is the, for teaching and the third mission is engaging. He's got a solid record in a lifelong record in action research, community-based research. He studies civic engagement, social policies, um, working together in solidarity. He's been involved in, a, in a, a long number and remains engaged. He's one of the European leaders, you know, in this whole field of, of, uh, of research, knowledge, and, and engagement has worked with a number of European uh, projects and can, can, continues to do so. Um, he's very involved in, uh, in impact evaluation on, of national and local projects. Um, as the coordinator of the Italian, we have two Knowledge for Change hubs in Italy. He is the coordinator of the, the whole Italian Knowledge for Change hub. And I, I think what Andrea brings uh, is, uh, is, a, is a concrete example of the kind of, of talking about respect for the knowledge created by non-academics, by people living their lives, uh, engaged their, their uh, experiential knowledge. Um, his work over many years um, with a particular community in Sassari, where he's from, is, has, offers much for us to learn. So I'm very, very anxious to, to hear from you, uh, Andrea. And I give you the floor. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Bud. And uh, thank you um, all for inviting me here today. Um, this is a very interesting conversation we're having here. And uh, um, I suspect that some of the things I will, I will talk about today, but you already uh, know some of it. I'll try to, uh, yes, share a, a story after all, of engagement with the community. And um, I will try to, to be short because this is a 10 years uh, long story up to now. Um, it's the story of our engagement in Santa Maria di Pisa, which is a, an excluded neighborhood in the, in the city of Sassari. So not, not a large, very large community, but uh, very clearly located in an area a peripheral area of the city of Sassari, which is a medium-sized uh, uh, city in Italy, a, a city of about uh, uh, 150,000 people. Um, 
I will, uh, let me share the, uh, my, my, my slides. Um, let's see how to do this. Here. Um, is it okay, Bud? Can you, can you see it? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, so, uh, as I said, uh, this is a, a story which is 10 years long. And in, in, in here in this line, in this timeline that I, that I set down, uh, you have a, um, a sort of milestones, which are projects. And this is one of the first thing I wanted to share with you because uh, we were talking before with our colleagues and friends about the characteristics of, of modern science and uh, how to get rid of some uh, uh, not, uh, not uh, so uh, um, good characteristics of modern science. One of the characteristics that I find in modern science is that it goes on mainly by projects, single projects that are of interest to the researcher. So while the story I'm going to tell you about today is about the, um, our, our, our tentative to not to go, yes, work by, by projects because that's how we get funded, but by enchaining projects. So trying to, to have a, a whole connection between, between the different, the different uh, uh, research, action research project that we carry on in the neighborhood. This is the first characteristic. So transforming the projects into a research program. First characteristics. Second characteristic is that um, I will try to, to go very quickly through each one of these projects, but um, uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share with you is the fact is the evolution that we've had throughout time. Uh, we, uh, the, first, uh, the first projects that we, we started with uh, were mainly our own interest. And little by little, the, um, we came to co-design so to um, by setting up, so it's not only uh, going by through projects that are of the interest of the researcher, but is going through programs that are set up with the local community. And that's the second part that I would like to, to, to point out, which is uh, for me sort of a, a operationalizing decolonization, which goes through uh, building equitable partnership. So this is, uh, these are the main features of the, of the uh, story I'm going to tell you about today. We've started in, in, in 2012 with this um, project, uh, which is called, uh, was connected to the a, a worldwide initiative, the Equity and Sustainability Field Earrings, which was promoted by, uh, by Initiative for Equality to bring the voice of communities into the UN agenda. Um, and then uh, right, uh, this, this, this was so uh, implemented, this first project was implemented mainly through typical um, instruments like interviews and, and, and questionnaires. And we also trained some PhDs to, to community-based research, but mainly um, the community did not feel the need for this research. Uh, whereas with the second wave of project, uh, which is, uh, which are um, several projects that are called Capacitazione, funded by the uh, Fondazione di Sardegna, a local foundation, we could little by little build the relationship, an active relationship with the citizens, starting from the, the ones that are, were most in need. Uh, that is people that were in charge to, to the social work and, uh, and we, 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 we keep started conversations with them in, uh, uh, to, to identify the needs of the community, but also to identify the, uh, the resources of the community. This was a turning point because we adopted a, what is called an asset-based community development approach, which brought us to see positive things in, uh, through community walks, community mapping, and through scenario workshop, we came to elaborate what we called a platform. We call it Pisa, uh, playing with the name of the neighborhood, which is Santa Maria di Pisa. It's a, a project platform, participative project uh, platform for innovation and active social innovation. Um, 
we we may say that these are uh, you you see the uh, some of the SDGs in the bottom of this slide because it's sort of like uh, our our SDGs in the neighborhood, uh, except that these SDGs were not were not uh, elaborated somewhere in in in, uh, in in the in the UN system, but rather in our own community, and this is our community setting the agenda for themselves for their own development. And the idea behind this is that this agenda is the key for us to connect with all the organizations, be them uh, private, uh, social private or public that work in the, in the neighborhood, you know, social workers, educators, associations, volunteers, uh, colleagues in university, municipality, so this is our, our, our beacon to orient our action in the neighborhood. Uh, the idea is that this is the program, projects, single projects that are, can be elaborated by single, uh, single organizations or association of organizations can refer to this platform that can be sort of a guidance to their action and harmonize them and, and bring them together and so that the texture, the design of the whole action in, in the neighborhood can, can be transparent and evident to everybody, not only a collection of projects. Uh, this was one of the main problem, according to our, to our people in, in, in our community uh, partners uh, in the neighborhood. They seen along the years, many projects uh, just you know, thrown over them. And these projects, they have a beginning, they have an end, everybody's happy at the end, but then at the end, everybody says goodbye, the organization gets the, the funding and the people in the community stay as they are. So we wanted to re reverse this and we wanted to bring this into a common view. So this is our, 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 our policy agenda for the neighborhood. And we're trying to pull together um, organizations, as I said, but also the municipality into this. I will come to this issue later on when I point out challenges. Eventually, this allowed us to, to do some, some action within the Knowledge for Change program for the training of our mentors. And uh, uh, later on, it, it turned out to be into co-designing uh, uh, activities. These are activities, for instance, that were co-designed with the, with the local school, with the elementary school. The kids that did a, a wonderful job, which some might call like a citizen science work, but a very extensive one, setting their own learning and knowledge objective and, and uh, working out their methodology and working out the, the data collection and the presentation. Presentation was wonderful. They ended up with, a, with an exhibition. They showed it to other kids in other schools uh, across the town about their identity, where they come from through an exhibition and also by, through a, 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 a typical way of, of uh, 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 storytelling, which is a Japanese storytelling, which is called kamishibai. Um, in a, another example of co-designing was done with, uh, with a, a group of women, uh, Ola Stoffa Per, um, which is about women empowerment uh, through creativity and self-employment. Uh, this is an ongoing project, which uh, um, we hope will, will end up by setting up the creation of a neighborhood tailor, uh, tailor's shop that could uh, serve the whole, the whole neighborhood. But other things came out of this, for instance, of all this cooperation, this activism that we were able to, uh, to um, stimulate in the neighborhood, uh, like the creation of a, of a local neighborhood uh, council, which is uh, uh, constantly in contact with the local administration, but also a, a, a health point uh, and, other, and other initiatives. Uh, next, uh, coming up now, we have a, a, a project which is about, uh, which will start now in October. Uh, we are very excited about this because it's about developing an operational prototype for community mobilization for emergency recovery, uh, which is clearly connected to, to COVID. It's a funding by the Italian Ministry of University and Research. 
And uh, this will be uh, most probably starting within a year, but it's a, a very large pro program done with a uh, co-designed also with the local municipality about uh, uh, involving civil society in uh, uh, innovative processes of co-designing and co-management of collective utility goods, uh, notably connected to uh, buildings and public buildings. So uh, this is all to, to, uh, to, uh, to say that um, how um, we were able, so this, this is not a collection, once again, of projects. This is a, a, a research program which was not set in the very beginning. We can reconstruct this only, only reflectively by looking at the past, but also because this was built with the people, for the people, but with the people. And uh, once again, uh, I want to be very clear about uh, uh, the utility of this platform in orienting us and, uh, and being our guide for, for future projects with, uh, with, uh, with, and, 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 uh, for building equitable partnerships uh, through co-designing uh, action and research in the neighborhood. We, uh, along these 10 years, we have uh, faced, of course, uh, several challenges. Uh, I would like to point out two of these challenges. Uh, the first one is a growing neoliberal pressure, uh, which is uh, particularly severe uh, uh, concerning our, our structured partners like CSOs, community um, civil society organization, or as we call them, third sector here in Italy. So associations, social cooperatives, they are uh, really, um, feeling the pressure of doing more with less, for instance, like, but just like universities, but just like uh, social workers and educators working in the municipality. Um, they, they are interested by the growing pressure of new public management. And I would say they are uh, very heavily influenced by this double colonization, I, I, I would call uh, this, is the colonization of the market logics. Uh, over uh, Polanyi uh, thought that uh, the state, the community, and the market. You remember the great, the great transitions, the transition 1944. Polanyi said we have two, three main uh, regulatory principles uh, in our in our societal life. One is the one of the market, where the regulatory principle is exchange. I give you this, and you give me this. Uh, then you have the the, the state. Uh, which is um, about um, redistribution. So uh, the state gets resources from, uh, from uh, all citizens and redistributes e equally, hopefully, among citizens and the community uh, where the regulation is uh, mainly re reciprocity and solidarity. And you may think that uh, CSOs, they work uh, mainly through this principle, but they're more and more colonized by the principle of marketizations, just like the public sector uh, through new public management logics that are uh, very, very strong uh, through uh, growing competition, uh, through um, outsearching, uh, unstable jobs, uh, precarious jobs, et cetera, et cetera. This these problem that I, this challenge that I can only state here comes across another challenge, which is the channel of the present state and future of democracy. This is what we deal with most of the time. Uh, political representation and participation, uh, populism, expanding growing populism and nationalism are interesting more and more the life of citizens, but also the decision-making process is very strongly affected by this in um, institutions and political parties. What I'm referring to especially is this fact, is the fact that we and the citizens were sort of uh, compelled to elaborate the PISA platform. It's a, it's a policy agenda that the municipality does not take care of. Um, uh, in the past, uh, at least in Europe, we, uh, we used to have what we called intermediate bodies, that is political parties or trade unions. What did these intermediate bodies do? do? They, they took the uh, societal needs, 
they elaborated them, they uh, transformed them with their with the citizens into uh, political demands. So the passage was translating needs into political demands and then into political proposals and eventually programs and acts. This is not there anymore right now. The, one of the problem with populism is exactly that all these passages are not taken care of by anybody, not by the parties. At least uh, if you see, if you look at the most populist politicians in Italy, they take what the talk in, in the bars and they bring it straight to the parliament with the, exactly the same words. Uh, what we had to do in, in Pisa is to rebuild, uh, uh, collect the needs and elaborate with the citizens. What does this mean in, 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 in terms of political demands, but also what it means in terms of political proposal? So this is what PISA is about, is setting the policy agenda and we're trying to be the actors in between sort of, because we are an institution with the municipality in order for the municipality to pick up this agenda and make it its own. So hopefully in the future with this large project program that I mentioned before, we'll be able to do so. But this is a, a challenge because uh, universities are not structured to, to, to act as democratic body, no, not as they are right now. They are governed democratically, hopefully, but not necessarily their main role is, to, uh, uh, is conceived to uh, participate in this way uh, into the policy debate. So these are uh, um, some of the challenges that I wanted to point out in some of the um, characteristics of our action that I wanted to point out, uh, trying to have a whole uh, comprehension, not fragment our research pro uh, uh, program, but keep it together and elaborate it with the citizens, with the community through equitable partnerships. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Andrea. I think that uh, as, you, as you note, uh, your work uh, is an excellent example of, of what it means to operationalize uh, decolonization. It also uh, gives us, um, you know, in thinking about uh, the diversity of knowledge and diverse epistemologies, it, it also uh, uh, introduces us to the, uh, the way in which uh, the, the, the knowledge of working class women and men, uh, the knowledge of people uh, outside the mainstream who are excluded from power and uh, decision making, how that their knowledge and their way of naming the world uh, as Paulo Freire would say, has been uh, systematically excluded in order to uh, sustain uh, the power relations which support, you know, the now the neoliberal state, but which support, you know, the kind of uh, uh, of, of, of market uh, capitalism that the world now sees. Um, it's my very great pleasure now to introduce you to to Leslie Chan. Leslie and I met uh, some years ago, um, and I've become the more, the, as I've got, gotten to know Leslie and his work, I'm more and more uh, inspired. Leslie is, uh, works what I would say at the, at the, at the front line of, of, the, of, of the architecture of, know, of open knowledge. So we, we've spoken about indigenous knowledge, about, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, an intellectual and policy related talk from from Catherine we've we've heard an example of how this work could be applied uh, in in a community but um, uh, all of this um, uh, begs the question about uh, what is the uh, what is the new the, what is the architecture by which um, you know these these broader epistemologies and this broader concept of knowledge, how do we, uh, you know, how do we uh, uh, access those whose knowledge, you know, you know, can is, you know, is, is circulating and and so forth. So, um, Leslie is the uh, he's an associate professor 
in the Department of Global Development Studies at the University of Toronto. He's director of a very interesting structure called the Knowledge Equity Lab. Um, his uh, teaching and professional interests uh, center on the geopolitics of knowledge production and circulation and with a focus on how networking technologies are enabling new forms of collaboration while also amplifying and reproducing embedded power relationships and inequality. In particular, Leslie has been exploring the dynamics of university community partnerships and the meetings and around knowledge co-creation, participatory research, and how community engaged modes of knowledge production could contribute to different frameworks of valuing diverse knowledges. Since the year 2000, Leslie has served as the director of BioLine International. It's an open access platform for scientific journals from the global south. He's also on the advisory board of a number of very important uh, open access organizations, including the San Francisco De Declaration on Research Assessment, or the, sometimes called DORA, the uh, Directory of Open Access Journals, which has, I think, 16 or 17,000 open access journals in it. And he's on the steering committee of Invest in Open um, um, uh, Infrastructure. So I'm uh, just delighted, Leslie, thank you so much for being, for joining us today and for, uh, and uh, we very much look forward uh, to your thoughts. Over to you. Thank you, Bud, uh, for that very generous introduction um, and, and for the invitation to take part in uh, this conversation with uh, many distinguished colleagues. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Lorna for her uh, keynote address uh, been inspired by Lorna's work uh, in recent years and learn a lot from her, her broad wisdoms about indigenous knowledge and uh, uh, and I also have the double pleasure here because I also have been uh, admire of Professor Odora Hopus work uh, and I have been reading your work on cognitive justice and I have uh, been uh, uh, using your work in, in, in my own thinking. Uh, and of course, uh, so this is a great pleasure indeed. And of course, Bud's work on knowledge democracy with uh, Rajas Tandor and their pioneering work in uh, community uh, engaged research and participatory research. Uh, has been very much uh, things that I have learned a lot from. Uh, and I think it's important to, to uh, acknowledge these different knowledge traditions, if you will, with, even within the academia, as we don't tend to speak to each other across disciplines and across institutions. So this is a great way for us to, to, to remember, to, 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 to remind ourselves uh, how much we do align in terms of our, our, of our common values, even though we might speak in slightly different languages and emphasis. Uh, and so on, on that note, I, I want to also acknowledge uh, the fact that we are speaking over the internet, over the cloud, uh, but the cloud itself is deeply, deeply materialistic. That is, it is possible only because of his connections through the wire, through the cable, through the hubs, and through our computer devices. And it has reminded us, as Professor William reminded us, that we're all deeply connected in one way or the other. But most of all, we are deeply indebted to the land on which we work. And so at the University of Toronto, uh, our land has been the ancestral land of the Huron Wendak uh, and the most recently, the Mississauga uh, of the Credit Rivers. And for, uh, for thousands of years, the indigenous people have been taking care of this land. Without that, uh, we would not be enjoying the kind of institutional benefits that we have today. And it is also a reminder that the benefits we enjoy today has a colonial legacy, right? The, the cloud that we are enjoying right now to talk to each other uh, have cables, as I mentioned, and those cables actually follow largely the colonial, colonial infrastructures of the past. That is, if you look at where those cables are laid, the undersea cables and, and the land cables, they, they very much follow the pathway of the colonial uh, uh, infrastructures from the past. And so because of that colonial infrastructure, 
we still have very highly unequal uh, access to the internet, as we very well know, but that unequal access is not accidental. That unequal access uh, has been designed uh, historically to advantage certain groups of people over others. Uh, and this continue, we continue to live in those kind of, of design. Uh, and so the work I have been work, looking at has been largely about understanding how the design has really continued to structure the kind of deep inequities uh, among society. Uh, and I look at knowledge production as a particular case studies uh, uh, focus as a way to kind of explore and uh, interrogate these kind of uh, embedded inequalities. Uh, and because we as academics uh, are on a daily basis, that's our job to be about uh, producing knowledge, sharing knowledge uh, and circulating knowledge. It is all the more important that we look at ourselves and, and look at how we are uh, complicit uh, in uh, either uh, perpetuating the existing system of inequality, or are we are we trying to to dismantle uh, the system uh, through other means of uh, infrastructuring? Um, and so uh, the talk I have today is about open infrastructures, and uh, and and it's about bibliodiversity and infrastructure. And uh, I'm gonna actually. Uh, uh, show you a few slides because I think this is also uh, quite instrumental, uh, some of these examples. Um, so I'm going to go to my slides now. And I, I, I cannot see your faces right now, but I presume uh, you can actually see my slides. But can you actually yeah. see the slides? Put on a full slide. It's, I'm seeing all of the slides together. There you go, excellent. Okay, great. Um, so um, I wanna talk about the relationship between uh, the, the kind of system design that I was mentioning and the kind of uh, open infrastructure that we like to envision and, and ask this question about the relationship between bibliodiversity and, and, and open infrastructure. And, and the argument I wanna make is that we cannot have uh, diversity and, uh, knowledge diversity and bibliodiversity without open infrastructure. In fact, uh, there's been a lot of talk about open science, open access, and so forth, but a lot of those uh, production of, of those knowledge is still under the control of closed infrastructures, right? So we really cannot have real open access until we have uh, um, real open infrastructure. And I would define what I mean by open infrastructures. And I also want to make the argument that open infrastructure is, can be seen as a form of a social vaccine. And the ideas I, I borrow from uh, a number of um, uh, medical researchers, most recently from uh, Fran Baum and uh, Sharon Fry, talking about the current pandemic, that, that we tend to think of science as being the solution to all our problems. And these magic bullet, like the vaccines, once we found it, we can cure anything like, uh, uh, and so forth. But they reminded us that really for, for our well-being, uh, overall well-being and societal well-being, we need to think more broadly about social infrastructure so that everybody have access to healthcare, education, fair jobs, and, and fair representation in governance. And these are the kind of things that determines our health more so than uh, the vaccine itself. I mean, the science that of vaccines and the kind of magic bullet thinking is really what has been part of the problem in terms of driving our social system to almost a blink of extinction in terms of environmental destructions. We need to think more about the care economy, the social infrastructure, the solidarity that we need to build to support each other. Uh, not only uh, then we can solve quick problem in time of crisis. These are things that will keep us uh, sustainable in the long term. 
some of these insights that I've derived from, uh, that what I want to speak from uh, rest on some of the earlier work we did where I was fortunate enough to co-lead a, a international research network uh, called the Open and Collaborative, Collaborative Science and Development Network from which we were able to work with a number of organizations, local community groups and scientific uh, uh, teams from, from, from around the world learning about what citizens do in terms of their knowledge uh, and uh, productions, knowledge keeping and knowledge sharing practices. Um, and uh, we, we have put some of our learning into this book and it's open access. I again, also wanna acknowledge uh, the, the privilege of working with Bud and Rajash and the late Professor Florence Piron uh, and, and uh, Professor Williams in, in working on this paper on open science beyond open access for and with communities. And it was through this process last year that again, I was able to re refine some of my thinking about infrastructures and why it is to have, why it is important to have uh, what I call inclusive infrastructure. Uh, and we also draw some of these ideas from uh, uh, a manifesto that we co-produced a few years ago. Uh, and we begin to, formulate this idea of inclusive infrastructure as these kind of basis, uh, a collection of tools, networks, platforms, and above all people uh, that allow for, uh, for the creation of multiple forms of participation. Uh, and the, the reason, uh, and the reason this is important is because again, as I said, it, you, you cannot have open infrastructure, uh, you cannot have open scholarship and open access without open infrastructure. Uh, and this is, this is really to address why technology has to be uh, more deliberately interrogated in terms of how it structures our behavior uh, and how it uh, allow us to do things, but also how it, how it uh, restrict us from doing things. And Professor Williams earlier speak, spoke about uh, new forms of colonization through technology. And I have a couple of examples to share because we don't tend to think of infrastructure and technologies as being a form of, of, of new form of colonization and enclosure, but they are, but they are, but they definitely are. Uh, uh, and I also want to, uh, before I show you the example, uh, share another key lessons we learned from the open uh, the OCSD net, uh, and that is this notion of of, of uh, situated openness. Again, there's a tendency in the open access debate to think about open access as being either or. Uh, but but our, our experience uh, uh, working with diverse stakeholders uh, reminded us that there's, you cannot apply a simple universal binary uh, definitions uh, across conditions. And there are a lot of invisible uh, uh, barriers and conditions that uh, continue to structure the way we, we make knowledge, share knowledge and, and circulate knowledge. Uh, here's an example so of infrastructure. I work at the University of Toronto. This a few years ago, I was looking for this article from another South African colleagues on this article, who, which is very appropriate about uh, whose knowledge matters and, and the importance of knowledge circulation from the global self. So I look at the University of Toronto library catalog uh, because I always tell my students, you know, don't trust Google, go to your university library catalog. Uh, uh, you will find trusted sources. And my library catalog tells me that there is no access to this journal. Uh, and, and the reason uh, that it I found out that it was no access to this journal, the library is not cataloging it, it's because the library think it is not peer reviewed. Now, of course, this is not a decision made by the University of Toronto Library. University of Toronto Library outsourced their search engine to a third party private company. And increasingly, most universities outsource these kind of infrastructure to private companies. And these private companies are the one that make decisions about what constitute legitimate knowledge or what constitute, uh, uh, in this case, even peer review, uh, so that the, the University of Toronto uh, uh, users will will find or not find them based on those criteria that they they decide. Now, who are these people that are making this decision? We don't really know. Uh, but I, when I when I went to Google and looked for this journal, 
sure enough, this journal is actually a South African journal has been well circulated It's a fully open access journals that anyone can go find on the internet and download it. And it is a peer review journal. It is an international peer review journal. So somehow the library have made the decision not to make it accessible uh, to a large group of user based on some opaque decision. This is what I mean by how this design technology design become a new form of enclosure. It can actually make open uh, content invisible because someone have made the decision that it is not the right kind of information to be included. So I wanna argue that this is, this is very, very pervasive. Uh, and so it is important that when we think about bibliodiversity, uh, we think about uh, infrastructures that is also consonant with this kind of, uh, of, of uh, design. Uh, so that those decision-making uh, as to what knowledge gets circulated and shared has to be uh, community driven and not resting in the hand of a group of uh, powerful private companies that make this decision on very different economic reason. Now, bibliodiversity, some of you heard of this term, and but it, I just want to re remind us that it's actually been well formulated and there's a, uh, a Chilean publishing group in the 1990s called this uh, uh, to our attention because uh, they pointing out that many small publishers across Latin American countries, but in fact around the world, uh, have been slowly uh, uh, dying out. Uh, they're dying out uh, largely because, again, because of the market of publishing, um, because of the growing dominant power of the multinational publishers. They're able to bite up local publishers and basically kill them off so that they can dominate the marketplace of publishing. And this is not unusual. Unfortunately, this is how capitalism works. And, and this is uh, a form of, of, of cultural uh, extinction in many ways. So, the call for bio bibliodiversity is really a call for sustaining diverse form of, I love this phrase, complex self-sustaining system of storytelling. And, and this is where, again, in our knowledge system right now that we are terribly lacking, we are becoming more and more focused on writing journal articles, sometimes monograph, but we all write the same way. If you don't write the same way, if you don't conform to the journal's standards, uh, uh, you don't get published. So we become more and more uh, uh, narrow in terms of the way we express ourselves and tell story, uh, and our stories become more and more monochromatic. Uh, and so our cultural understanding and well-being also have been become much more narrow. And this is remind me of Vandana Shiva's uh, already long warned us about this monoculture of the mind uh, that treats diversity as disease and, 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 and create a coercive cultural structures that force everything into one single standards. Again, Professor Williams uh, spoke about that. But these standards are now increasingly being embedded into the technologies. And because they're embedded into the technologies and the infrastructures, they're invisible. They're defining how we work, how we how we circulate knowledge uh, without us really knowing how to question this. Here's an example. We've been mapping out a, a very big publisher. Many of you know Elsevier. And over the last 10 years or so, they've been systematically acquiring a lot of important basic infrastructures from article submissions to data archivings to uh, metrics creations to data analytics and university ranking system. Uh, they are now in the whole system of creating an end-to-end -end platform, um, monopolizing a lot of these uh, uh, system. Uh, and of course, uh, huge collections of journals uh, title that academics feel that they have to publish in in order to survive. And so they have this enormous power uh, in, 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 in encapsulating and enclosing academic productions. Uh, and so this is this enclosure uh, that, that it is increasingly worrisome. Uh, and I also get very, very frustrated when I, when I saw this announcement last year in the height of the pandemic, when UNESCO of all organization decided to sign a contract with uh, uh, another multinational publisher, Springer Nature uh, or Springer 
nature, of course, many of you know, used to be independent large publishers, and they merged in 2015 to become an even larger uh, corporations. Uh, but UNESCO, instead of supporting diversity of, of publishers from around the world, uh, decided that to sign on an agreement with them to publish all their own research with this one company. Uh, ball goes to mind. So why are why is UNESCO not supporting bibliodiversity in this sense? That is the diversity of output, outlets, and and languages as well. Now this is also also very annoying because we 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 were just talking about uh, Andre, Andrea was talking about this logics of capitalism in the university. And so I, I get really frustrated earlier when, when I talk about Elsevier's owning all these analytics and so forth, they've been pushing very hard on university ranking, which is another toxic system uh, of enclosure. Uh, and, and I'm looking at this, I just got this in the email this morning from a colleague and I can't help but share this, uh, that why are university uh, not questioning why they the ranking system itself. Why are they taking part in becoming the system uh, and, and willingly subjecting to this new form of colonization? Uh, and, and so this is this is something that we don't ask enough about. So in in closing, I I'm, I. Um, I mentioned that I'm part of an organization called Invest in Open Infrastructure, and, and this is where we really want to think hard about. Uh, how uh, we can collectively support different forms of building technologies uh, that enable diversity of participation of viewpoints of cultures of knowledge from the start. Uh, it's not an afterthought. It has to be designed from the ground up. And from in order to do so, we have to take the rights of research of every citizens to be central, that it is not only the researchers in a recognized university that produce knowledge. Citizens everywhere, people everywhere are knowledge makers, producers, and holders, and we don't give enough credit to them. And so how do we build infrastructures that allow these kind of broad participation uh, that would allow the, their, their rights to, to, to knowledge, their rights to create knowledge for themselves, for the community to be enabled. Uh, and as a, at the same time, uh, for academics to be able to think about it together so that we can start to break free from what this culture of compliance, compliance to these standards that are being set by uh, corporations that they have no business setting standards for in terms of public institution and our share values. And to do so, we need to rethink our economic models and, and our, 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 our way, the way we, we, we share resources. Uh, instead of these competitive structures of hierarchies and, and, and winner takes all funding model, for example, we really funding agencies need to rethink how they fund uh, uh, infrastructures. Uh, it is not about just you know, benefiting again the, 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 the few, uh, but how do we design so that uh, it is really a public good so that everybody could take part in it and use it as a form of uh, social vaccine against knowledge and closure. So I will stop here. I, I spoke very fast and uh, I'm sure there are lots of uh, point that may not be sufficiently clear. So I'm happy to answer the question later. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Leslie. Uh, fascinating, and I would say uh, somewhat terrifying. <laughs> uh, as uh, you know, for somebody who works, uh, you know, building capacity, um, you know, and uh, creating networks to support, you know, knowledge equity, knowledge democracy, the respect for indigenous knowledge, um, you know, which is a big, big movement, as as uh, as Catherine has said. Um, to see, uh, you know, when that big map you give of Elsevier's, um, the, the way that it's linked um, it is, uh, it, and how successful they have been in, I would say, you know, 10, 12 years um, in, in, uh, in creating this monopolistic, and the other thing is highly, um, you know, highly profitable. It, this is a, not only is this a, um, uh, you know, reinforcing a particular view of knowledge, 
but it is a, it's a, it's a huge extractive machine for, for drawing labor, uh, especially from academics. Our free labor is being uh, vacuumed up by these, these, uh, these big uh, multinational publishers using the kind of technological tools that they have. And they are translating that directly into absolutely incredible uh, profits um, when you know uh, you know when the, when the, the people who are actually uh, creating the knowledge uh, aren't being compensated at all and life as we know of an ordinary academic particularly in the global south is a very uh, hand to mouth business is is very tough to, to, to it's very irritating um, so thank you uh, Leslie for uh, and thank you for the work that you do, and thank you for sharing, um, you know, just this uh, <laughs> terrifying <laughs> insight into what we're facing. So um, I'm uh, delighted to, to invite uh, Irma, Irma Flores, Dr. Irma Flores, who's a, a very good friend of, uh, of mine um, and a, a real uh, leader. She's the, the Latin American uh, leader of the Knowledge for Change uh, consortium that Rajesh and I in, in our, with our UNESCO chair. She has a background in psychology, originally from the UNAM in Mexico, University in Mexico. She's uh, done work in community development with the Japanese International Cooperation Agency. She's got a master's degree in clinical psychology and another one in education and social development. And her PhD is in uh, uh, social Sciences, Childhood and Youth from the University of uh, Manizales, very interesting, engaged university in Colombia. Currently, she's an associate professor in faculty of education at the, at the very prestigious uh, University of Los Andes in Bogota. And in her research, she's dedicated to explore the facilitation of training processes and participatory pedagogical and educational action research of professionals in education and other disciplines. She's worked with many different communities in adult and higher education in Mexico, Colombia, and Cuba, and has been involved in curricular reform in higher education. And uh, she was um, she was trained as a as a mentor in our Knowledge for Change program in the very first cohort we did. I think that was in. Uh, in 19, in 2000 and 2018. So uh, Irma, thank you for uh, being with us this morning. I know we're very so grateful that you could be with us to share your own. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Okay, well, it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you. And I want to thank Bob and Rajesh for inviting me to this important conversation space. I also want to thank the organizers of the event because it's a pleasure to be here and to have this space to, to talk about my work. Well, I'm going to share my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I I have to to start my presentation uh, saying that this project started within the framework of my training as a mentor of the first court of the MTP from the Initiative Knowledge for Change. An, interna an international consortium for education in community-based research directed by Dr. Bud Hall and Dr. Rajesh Tandon, UNESCO co-chairs in community-based research and social responsibility in higher education. This project is the result of the alliance between the educational community of the Ciudad Educadora Espiritu Santo School and researchers or, or a research team from the Faculty of Education of the University of Los Andes. The partnership between school and university sought 
to join forces to promote a curricular reform. The curricular change led the school to achieve its goal of becoming an institution that educates local and global citizen, citizens who are responsible, responsible and committed to the achievement of social justice and peace. One of the aspects that allowed me to recognize the importance of carrying out this project in a school context were the proposal that I found in the document, Education for Sustainable Development Goals, Learning Objectives. The, the basic concepts in this document encourage nations to organize an educational response not only as a goal, but also to achieve the different sustainable development goals. As a team, the, 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 the school community and the research team of the university, we think that for Colombia and the challenge, challenge it faced to create the necessary conditions for the peace building process, Education and schools plays a fundamental role in achieving transformation towards other forms of peace, peaceful coexistence. In this sense, in this sense, the educational proposal in Colombia must be strengthened to meet the objective of trained citizens committed to peace building and its sustainability, who accept diversity and contribute to building fair and equitable relationships and interactions among human beings. This is why the Ciudad Educadora School project becomes a laboratory through which a curricular proposal that supports the objective of peace building in Colombia can be strengthened. Me, but I can, I can move. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, a pro the proposal for curricular, cha cur curricular change for peace building was conducted by the University of Los Andes team and the educational community in a CBPR process engagement. In this, in this process, we recognize the importance of social responsiveness of the universities, seek to respond to real need within their communities through provision of intellectual leadership in areas of community interest and concern offering university resources and facilities for community use and working with communities for mutual productive outcomes. Our engagement context is Ciudad Educadora School. The context in where the Ciudad Educadora is, is in the city of Villavicencio in the department of Meta Colombia. El Meta is one of the 32 departments of Colombia, is in the central eastern region of the country. Before the signing of the peace agreement between the FARC and the Colombian government in 2016, the de department of Meta was a territory in where the armed conflict was serious, had serious consequences for civil society. The development of the armed conflict in Meta meant the presence of multiple armed actors, both illegal and legal, through the actions of the army and the policy. This unleashed a campaign to establish a territorial domain in various mun municipalities, both in urban and rural areas, which implies an impairment of the rights of civil society in the framework of armed confrontation, domination, social and economic control, derivat 
der derivatives of the action of both groups. These are some of the reasons why this project is important for the region and for the city of Villavicencio in particular. We think that the importance of including peace building process in school curricula will guarantee greater awareness of the importance of educating citizens committed to the social development that is required for a better coexistence in the region and in the country. This timeline, timeline present the, se the sequence of actions to attain the objective of curricular transformation that have been carried out so far between the team of the University of Los Andes and the educational community of Ciudad Educadora Espiritu Santo School in the city of Villavicencio, Department of Meta in Colombia. The first meetings were held between the directors of the Ciudad Educadora Espiritu Santo School and the team of the Faculty of Education. The main objective of this alliance between the school's educational community and the researchers of the university was to join efforts to promote processes of change and improvement so that the school may achieve its goal of be being an institution that forms responsible local and global citizens committed to justice and social, social peace. At the beginning of the year, 2018, after co constructing the participatory action research plan with the school's management team, the first step in the process was to sensitize the school community to participate in this process of curricular reform. The, senti the senti sensitization process was successful and allowed to start the first round of participatory workshops to reflect and evaluate the curriculum that was in force at that time. Students, teachers, parents, and the school administrator, administration participate in these workshops. The product, the product of these workshops was the design of the new cur curricular propose, proposal. As a result of these workshops, the design of the new curriculum was finalized and the action plan for its implementation began. Towards the end of that year and the beginning of the year 2020, a new process of reflection on the actions implemented began and the first result of the new proposal began to be observed. Uh, the university team and the different participants of the school community held several meetings in which we reached, reached an agreement that to achieve the curricular change, we should comply with six basic conditions. First, university and school community engagement for curriculum reform, that the curricular change will be carried out in collaboration, co-construction and alliance between the team of researchers from the university and the school community to guarantee the dialogue of knowledge. Second condition, the school must achieve a core instructional program, program with qualified teachers, a challenging curriculum, and high standards and, expect, and expectations for students and the school community. Third condition, community engagement together with school efforts promote a school climate that is safe, supportive, and respectful and that connects students to a broader learning community. Condition four, there is mutual respect and effective co collaboration among parents, families, school, staff, and university team. Condition five, teachers are trained considering the different needs for the opera opera operationalization of the new curriculum. Condition six, Students are motivated and engaged in learning, both in school and in community, community settings during, during and after school. In this, in this picture, you can see this collage. We can observe the particip participation of the school community, including the university team, as we construct the curricular change.
in as part of the curricular transformation, it was concluded that the general objective of the reform would be educate into integral citizens in an environment enriching, democratic, and sustainable that allows and enhances their ability to transform themselves and transform the environment, as well as facing local cha challenges and global regions of the 21 century guiding this training towards sustainable human development. How will Ciudad Educadora shift those objectives with a new curriculum that was reached to achieve this objective? The conclusion was reached that the curriculum should be integral. It is a compressive curricula, curriculum as it is open, flexible, and diverse. It assumes the centrality of students learning based on their interest and the development of skills. Transdisciplinary, understanding transdisciplinarity as the need of scientific knowledge to be nurtured and provide a global perspective that is not limited to disciplines or their fields, which goes in the direction of considering the world in its diverse unit. Experiential, is a form of learning that responds to a teaching strategy with an holistic perspective designed to relate academic learning to real life through practice-based activities. As a result of the participatory process for curriculum reform, the different participants teachers, students, parents, the board of directors, the school related communities, reached the conclusion that the pedagogical model is based mainly on social cultural, social constructivist theories, as well as meaningful and humanistic learning. Considering the new curricular proposal, that aims to be integral, transdisciplinary, and experiential, the pedagogical process in the classroom is developed using dynamics that, that are problems and projects based, using multidimensional, transdisciplinary, and holistic methodologies. This dynamic allows students to understand the complexity of biological, social, scientific, economic, political, and cultural phenomena. Didactics promote in any person the, the active and participatory construction of concepts and knowledge applicable to spe specific situations. The learning environments are rich in provocative experience with an, with, with an indifferent settings. In addition to multiply relationships, peers, teachers, environment, parents, and languages. Finally, approaches that allow the development of the mental processes of information, representation, and action, leading them to the integral development of competencies that are given in the, in the five proposed pillars of the curricular reform, being, living together, knowing, doing, and transforming. To achieve the above, for main, four main projects were designed to guide the learning experience of the students. These projects allow students to design proposals to work with communities surrounding the school to develop solutions to real problems, using knowledge as a way for co-construction and democratization. The first, the first project, Ciudad Educadora Citizen, in this project, students are expected to make an inquiry about that what is to be a citizen of the world, family, school, city relations, relationships from the physical, spiritual, and social dimensions of being. The second one, educating in the city. 
Students are expected to make an inquiry about the world's organization systems based on the relationship between human beings, their decisions, and their activities. The third project, Traveling in the Footsteps, an inquiry about the traces that science, nature, and human societies have left, left over time. Also, the temporal and spatial location and travel as possibility of human interrelation. The fourth project, Green City, students are expected to make an inquiry about the environment and responsibility as human beings in the management of nat natural resources and the sustainability of the planet. Uh, as a result of the curricular reform, also students from the different educational levels of the school have begun to have real experience in community contexts. I'm going to talk about the, the experience of high school students that they uh, work with communities di directly. The students with a community approach these problems from a transdisciplinary perspective that allows them to have complex understandings of how to relate to the real and felt needs of the communities of the communities with which they work. Finally, I'm going to refer only to the to four projects. Some of these projects are productive projects with artisan women from the region that corresponds to general project traveling in the footsteps. Projects to improve the disinfection of agricultural soils that corresponds to the general project Green City and projects of adult education that corresponds to the general project Ciudad Educadora Citizen. The purpose of these projects is to develop the students' commitment to the community surroundings, the school, through the development of projects who, whose objective is to co-build possibilities to change around problems and the felt needs of those communities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Irma. What I think uh, your, uh, your fascinating study uh, shows us or your presentation shows us is that um, you know we've talked about the need to transform uh, we've talked about uh, needing to uh, to change the way that we uh, work between the universities and communities we've uh, we've talked about the the need for national policies and international standards we've talked about the architecture of of open science and now where you what you have added to us is the the importance of transforming the school. Uh, the school is the is the most widely distributed uh, human institution in the world, and uh, what happens in the school is critical. And the I think that the model which you have shown us, which uh, which uh, was built within that context of the the Colombian uh, post Civil War situation, which is very contextually based, but also could be used to, uh, you know, to, to build, you know, for, uh, for, for sustainability, facing the climate crisis, for, uh, for, for indigenizing, you know, our, you know, our schools so that they are open to new forms of knowledge. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, thank you, I'd like to Thank all of those of you who are listening. Uh, get your questions ready. Um, we've got uh, uh, one more uh, uh, presentation. Paolo is going to, uh, to, to make some comments uh, as one of the, the organizers. And uh, as one of my, my uh, Paolo and Rajesh and I were part of the original uh, International Participatory Research Network in the 1970s and 80s, a time when the very word participatory research struck fear into the hearts of mainstream academics. So you can see how far we've come. Perhaps we're still frightening 
a lot of mainstream academics, but uh, here we are still still going. So Paolo, your, uh, your comments, please. Microphone, microphone, Paolo. Okay. Uh, it was very interesting, uh, this uh, round table. Uh, I have some suggestion uh, in these problems you developed. Uh, the team is a knowledge democracy for health citizenship. And uh, I, I like to explain uh, very shortly my experience on transdisciplinary participatory action research. As Bud uh, remember, you started <laughs> many years ago about this. And uh, I, uh, the next please. And uh, I work a lot in the other years, a long way in the last 50 years with the local communities in different countries in Europe, Latin America and Africa. And uh, I noted that pa uh, participatory action research by uh, my friends is very connected uh, with the transdisciplinary. Uh, uh, the PAR uh, has uh, this distinct point. One is education of existence, another investigation of reality, and another is action of change. And uh, we work a lot uh, in depth uh, investigation uh, at epistemology, theory, and practice, uh, and also in project uh, on sustainably integrated development of local and regional communities in formal education, school, and non formal education. Uh, I like to see, it, uh, like see Irma, we also have some projects uh, uh, on uh, transdisciplinary curricula on uh, sustainable development link to, uh, to culture of peace uh, is, is another occasion you can uh, change our point of view. There are many, many points, common points. Uh, the next please. Um, and uh, we, we study about the knowledge creation and the production and uh, the focus uh, of our approach on participatory action research is uh, the potential of a personal educational process. That is, that, that is at the final point, the, the, the motor where start and when finish the change inside the person, inside the community, inside the society. And we know, and we know that there are very, very short uh, connection between complex mind theory, theory and the rational intelligence practice. Uh, you should look at center participation, action, and research. You can see participation is very linked to uh, sens sensory, motor, and emotional potential. That is a knowledge of uh, that we uh, what he, what we have received from uh, uh, the evolution of life uh, many many uh, uh, centuries or years. Uh, action uh, that is centered on the operating potential because action is uh, is uh, connected with the emotional and uh, in other sense with the rational potential. The rational potential is uh, the third uh, cognitive domain of research. And uh, in, uh, in practice uh, of power, we, we join feel, think, and act to, to, to change from sense to sentiment in the sense that the feeling of uh, Human community is the origin and also the, the final, final issue of uh, mm, intelligence, in rational intelligence. Next, please. Uh, 
uh, only to show uh, if you see uh, framework and the flow of participatory action research interdisciplinary action, we can see in the, we use in the research logic and dynamics of thinking from problem uh, until resolution problem. In the action, logic and dynamics of doing it from the activation to uh, act improving uh, that is uh, uh, to be responsible to, to have a decision on change. And the participation is a logic of dynamics feeling from uh, awareness to assuming position. And uh, after, in, in this sense, uh, there is a, an implementation of individual knowledge where you uh, start from previous knowledge in many, in many local communities, in many com communities, uh, indigenous communities in Africa, as, a, uh, as a, in a region of Sahel, or in with community of Maya in Guatemala, or uh, in, in Southern of America Latina with Mapuche in Chile. Uh, it's very interesting. What, what I said uh, in the first, uh, in the first contribution, what, what I said, uh, um, excuse me, Lorna, uh, in, this, in this approach, you can see the connection between the local knowledge, the community knowledge, the, the indigenous knowledge, the, the nature knowledge, the tangible and tangible culture of the local uh, community. And the third, the, the, the disciplinary knowledge. And I, I am agree with you that uh, uh, the crisis is exactly, exactly in the disciplinary approach. Because the disciplinary approach are very separated. As Lorna said, and also uh, you underlined in different contexts. And uh, that is a, a big problem in interdisciplinary approach, as you said at the end. And it's very interesting, these dynamics uh, between uh, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and the quartier knowledge, uh, also in other experience, also the Andrea. Uh, that is that is uh, a relationship with uh, uh, local knowledge of the community as uh, an intangible element, as house, as a tree, as a system of transport of economy, and uh, the contribution of a different contribution of a disciplinary. Uh, economic, uh, social, uh, sociology, psychology, uh, st structure of the, the urban structure and uh, medicine, all this, that is the difference between in the interdisciplinary and interdisciplinary because in disciplinary, I, as I, I, I noted in your contribution, in disciplinary, we start from us the, the epistemological statue of each discipline. And they try, they try to uh, enter in the problem, but they remain in, in their epistemology. For this reason, the transdisciplinary is a more advanced approach because uh, uh, we start from the problem. You start from real problem. Well, the first principle of a transdisciplinary as a as a uh, Nicolescu Basarab uh, said in, in uh, first congress on transdisciplinary, we the problem we can analyze at a different level of reality, and all as I remember with very pleasure uh, that alone and you said all is connected, all is connected. Now we are at these experiences. And uh, also uh, in, in physics, new physics, uh, and also we assist 
the unification of humanity in our time. Uh, uh, in this sense, uh, transdisciplinary, uh, also for uh, sustainable development project, as, a, as this kind of approach. We don't start from a discipline. We start from local knowledge, from knowledge of the people, from, from a personal uh, potential of knowledge of each participant. And we connected this uh, with problem and the discipline are involved in uh, according their capacity to solve the global problem. If they cannot solve, cannot participate to global problem to give uh, help to, to complex problem, they, can, they, they cannot uh, help. They, they, they are out because they are separate. In this sense, uh, I noted uh, the, the reflection on epistemology uh, on knowledge this, this, this uh, problem, this topic is very important in interdisciplinary approach. In uh, our Congress, uh, that is uh, one topic is very, very important. Do you know, do you know we start, we start uh, at the 8th, 30th of October, 2020, and uh, each week we have, uh, uh, sorry, which week we have two days uh, uh, in Wednesday and Friday, as you know, and which week uh, we develop different teams, different approach, but this team of knowledge or democracy of knowledge, as you say, open science, that is very fundamental. That is, that is the, the basis of a civilization, of a new civilization. Uh, I thanks uh, a lot uh, for the contribution. Uh, next, please, because I have to, to go at the end. The next one, please, is the, I know no time. The, the next one, well, uh, uh, I like to, to conclude uh, with this, uh, this theme. Uh, the barrier, our origin of the violence, the barrier, our origin of separation, separation between person, within community, within nation, between uh, discipline, within uh, specific type of knowledge, and uh, beyond, behind the discipline, what, uh, what, means, what, what means transdisciplinary, behind the discipline, through the discipline, uh, what, what we can, what, we, what, we, uh, what uh, can we encounter? We encounter the complex reality. Uh, in this sense, uh, transdisciplinary power can work for emancipated, intelligent democracy. One democracy, I, I like it only to, to have a check. Uh, power work reverses the hierarchical and segmented approach to human present on the planet. It recognizes respects and values to richness of species of each homo sapiens. In each human man is contained the universe. Each human man is a son of the universe. That is a holographic principle of Edgar Morin is another, uh, uh, our, uh, uh, we can say is the biggest uh, researcher on complexity. Uh, trap work transform the power focus of human knowledge on the planet. It recognizes the dignity and the human basis of the intelli intelligence potential of each Homo sapiens. Feeding and recursive enrichment of knowledge is the strategic path to qualify human life, solve its problem, assure equal relationship with other human beings, living beings on the planet. This relationship between the next place, uh, between uh, human human beings and, uh, and the planet uh, is very topic uh, in a transdisciplinary approach. As uh, we say, the local and the global development, they meet. Uh, at the final, uh, the power work, it overcome the antinomies and the contrast between different and multi-form of knowledge. It frees knowledge. You, you, you spoke about, uh, uh, 
the knowledge is free. The, the lodges uh, open uh, at different worlds. But I think there are many relationships between your contribution and the transdisciplinary approach we develop, uh, we are developing in, the, in our Congress. Well, beyond the barrier, beyond the barrier of sacredness knowledge, authoritarianism knowledge, no, communicab no communicability between scientific, cultural, social, and personal knowledge, separation between scientific areas like uh, human science and uh, uh, natural science, uh, technological science, uh, etc., and also between discipline. Uh, another, another barrier is absolute independence between the category of the beautiful, the good, the just, the true. Beyond the barrier, the transdisciplinary uh, free knowledge towards the depth of relational intelligence. That means complexity of intelligence in relation with reality, perfe perfectionability of knowledge, analysis of all kinds of problem knowledge, interconnection between scientific areas and between disciplines. Uh, in intermingling links between categories of art, ethics, justice, science. Science is not neutral. Neutral means uh, that science has a position, but, uh, but as uh, our potential of knowledge, creation of knowledge is, is connected, we cannot, uh, you cannot say that art, ethics, justice, science are not are connected. And at the end, uh, I, I, I finish this contribution. Uh, I thank you a lot. Uh, there is the, the last one I remember. Uh, yes, uh, the conclusion, uh, we need to, to go towards the emancipated intelli intelligent democracy. Uh, the power solves educational fragmentation. All of your contribution on the uh, territorial approach on education is exactly, exactly uh, beyond the fragmentation. It leads them back to the unity of the learning process of each woman, man, in the sustainable and solidarity anthropization of planetary coexistence. But overcomes the, qualify, the quality limits of representative democracy. It established the democracy of life and the knowledge according to relational intelligence. The homo complexus is born, realizing the unity man world through interconnected diversity. That is uh, the final conclusion of Lorna. That is very interesting. That is the, the, the final conclusion of, of, all, of all indigenous uh, people participating in this Congress. And uh, that is also the, 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 the principle uh, of Edgar Morin about unity man and the world. Unity in the different, difference in diversity and the diversity unified in the unity. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Paolo. I'm glad to see that you have been uh, keeping yourself very busy over the last 50 years. I look forward to having a next conversation in, in 50 years from now. <laughs> we have, uh, we, uh, we started a little bit late because of technical difficulties, but I, I don't want to go too long in respect of everybody's uh, commitment. So we'll go for uh, to five minutes after 11, uh, my time. So that means we've got 10 minutes, more or less 10 minutes um, for, uh, for any questions or comments. And I'm going to forego, uh, you know, making any further comments. There's a lot of comments that have been made by everybody and, uh, and this has been recorded. So people who want to, uh, uh, to if you want to share it with others, uh, the, we will be, we will be uh, provided with, a, with an end. So um, if uh, Marco, um, let's see if we, okay, now we've got one from uh, Vinod to Professor Irma. 
what will be the way in which open school of peace building relate to non-state actors facing oppressive, exploitative and dictatorial leaders in fragile and failed states? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer, but I believe the, the challenge to get the school to relate to non-state actors is very important. And I believe that it is necessary that we develop strategies that allow the school to be open so that non-state actors have a space from which they can structure proposals for change that allow their conditions to be changed without being victims of violence, extermination, and exclusion. I think maybe that's the answer I can give in this moment. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see, uh, let's see. Now we've got one to, uh, to the panelists from uh, Maria uh, D'Amelio of Brazil. How could the understanding of the levels of reality and logic of the included third proposed by transdisciplinary contribute to the works presented here? And then uh, she goes on to say, what is the importance of distinguishing multi-referentiality and multi-dimensionality um, as proposed by TD and discussed in the Congress? Um, I don't know anybody, anybody want to, uh, I'm not familiar personally with, with, with what was presented, uh, the logic of the included third. Does anybody, I don't know, Catherine, anybody know this? kind of language? You know, uh, when I give my keynotes and uh, I get instant uh, uh, um, uh, questions, I say 50% of the questions, you already have the answers. Don't ask me, think about it. Thank you. <laughs> um, Maggie, Maggie Huang, from Toronto has a <laughs> clarification question for Paulo. Can, can you elaborate on what you mean by perfectionability of knowledge within the definition of relational intelligence? Okay, there you go, Paulo. I have to answer, I have to answer. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's for all. <laughs> Okay, no, okay. it's for you, it's for you. No, because that, uh, you can see in our life, you you can you can have the the same ideas. You can have the the knowledge that uh, that don't change or that can go back and don't have a good evolution. That means perfect uh, perfectionability. That in knowledge you can you can change uh, in the sense the knowledge is evolved. And this is import important in the epistemology of science. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the self-correction of sciences is a principle, is a principle of uh, uh, relational intelligence because uh, uh, the, the, the advanced science is not dogmatic. They have, they have uh, developed a capacity to change his theory in relation with uh, uh, more deep relation with reality, as uh, in physics with Einstein, for example, or in all, or in all the case, and also in our life, and also in education. I don't know, I, I answered. I think you did very well. Um, <laughs> I, I think this is a... Uh, But you closed your microphone. Microphone. Thank you. Uh, this is a, probably a, a, a perfect time to, uh, for me to, uh, to thank the organizers, to thank uh, Julieta, the president, uh, to thank uh, Paolo, um, to thank uh, Marco, and, uh, and very importantly, to thank uh, Leslie, Paolo, Irma, Catherine, and Andrea uh, for really uh, this has been very, very stimulating. I'm, I've, I've made many, many notes.
and I hope that uh, the uh, the recording of this session will be made available uh, to to everybody because I we would many of us would like to share it uh, with our our colleagues and and students. I think I close with these words from Lorna. Um, we have beautiful minds. Let us keep them open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Perdón, oh, perdón. Ok, Julieta. Sí, perdón, eh, voy a hablar en español, me perdonen. Eh, hablaré despacio. Y en términos del tercer Congreso Mundial, agradecemos la presencia del equipo de Budol y todos los participantes eh, de varios países, que es la idea del Congreso, del tercer Congreso Mundial de Transdisciplinaridad. Y también porque es importante el diálogo que se establece en diferentes puntos de vista. Por ejemplo, lo que digo Caterin, eh, es muy importante la posición y relación eh, de, de la producción de la ciencia en relación a Occidente y en relación a África. Eh, yo le comentaba que en el Congreso... Eh, Caterine, en el Congreso tuvimos two, dos teams, dos grupos que hablaron sobre esos, esos temas. Ese grupo de África, dos, uno se llama Redes y otro se llama Refica de África, que trabajan esos temas eh, que, fueron, que son muy importantes. Y también creo que lo que plantea Bot en, su, en la mesa en esta semana, Justamente en todo el Congreso, uno de los temas, de los ejes del Congreso es justamente la, el tema de la ciencia abierta, pero más allá que la ciencia abierta, eh, abrimos el camino en el Congreso, no soy yo, el Congreso de, de Transdisciplinariedad abre el camino para los procesos cognitivos, todos los procesos cognitivos, lo que dio Lorna, ¿no? Todo lo que dijo Lorna, yo también hice un comentario a la conferencia de Lorna, diciendo que su conferencia estaba excelente y se articulaba con otras conferencias, otras presentaciones de América Latina y de África. Lo que planteó Lorna es un puente y un diálogo muy importante con lo que pasa en América del Norte, en Canadá, con los esquimales, los pueblos indígenas del Canadá, de Estados Unidos, de, de México, de los Andes, como, como conoce Irma, de, de, en Colombia, Perú, Ecuador, Bolivia. ¿no? Y en África, en África eh, también tenemos la, el problema de la descolonización, descolonización de África frente a Europa, y esa descolonización... Eh, no sé si Bob está de acuerdo o si está entendiendo, no sé, si, si la descolonialización implica una decolonialidad. No es igual descolonialización cuando se liberan de Europa, África, con el proceso de decolonialidad, que es una reconstrucción del ser, del conocer, del poder y del hacer. Qué pena que no, se, no puedo hablar en inglés fluidamente. Podría hablar, pero sería muy salvaje. <risa> sería terrible, no inglés. Pero eh, hablé en español de manera eh, lenta y espero que se pueda traducir en YouTube. Muchas gracias y seguimos el viernes. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And uh, some of you will see again on, uh, on Friday. Have a great night, a great day, wherever you are. And... Uh, Blessings Thank to you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank Bud, you. Bud, won't you translate that for us at least a, a, a bit of it so that, I mean. I, what I suggest, um, Julieta, what I suggest is you write that, is mm -hmm. you put that in a note, send it, it, yes. it, send it to, uh, to, uh, to me and I will translate it and send it to everybody. Okay. Yeah. Because I, we weren't, <laughs> We weren't prepared for, uh, uh, you know, at the end uh, for that, and so uh, we we uh, it was going a bit too fast. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. What right. you said is very important.
and we thank you very much. So blessings to everybody. Bye. And, uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.